And uh, today, with uh, we're going to talk about the third um, um, book on development economics by um, Banerjee and Duflo, two development economists, and the title of their book is uh, Poor Economics. Uh, for me, I, I think, for me, this is one of the best books I've writ read in the area of humanitarian engineering. I really um, think you should consider if you later on in life you you're sort of bored over the summer, pick this thing up. This is this is gives you um, nice understanding of low level people, you know, people on the ground in poverty and what it's like to live their lives in poverty. Um, it's a it's really quite a fantastic book. Um, so uh, Benergy and Duffalo, um, two professors at MIT and economics. Um, uh, of course, Banerjee's Indian. Uh, Master Dufflo is um, French. Uh, they did 15 years of work with people living on less than 99 cents a day. Okay, And this book is about that. Um, the book is Poor Economics, and it's got a long subtitle. Um, let's uh, get into it. So they, they start out um, in a contrast to Sachs and Easterly, they don't want to tackle the big questions about whether aid is good or bad in general. Okay, They want to focus on evidence to decide what to do in one local situation. In a sense, it's like a reaction to what Easterly said. Let's find out what really works, for sure. The concrete solutions and use those. Well, they're saying, okay, but here's how you go about that. So um, they say the specific anecdotes about what in one case, help the poor are not useful because they said that one it's such anecdotes can be found to support any position. I think this is a fantastic statement. This is something that can be quite irritating in this field. You talk to someone, they're all excited, and they because they did something that really helped, and they generalize this to the world and say this is going to solve the problems of the world if you only do this. Okay. And uh, I think, you know, there's a, some people need a high dose of uh, uh, a little modesty and um, understanding that every prob local problem is different than every other local problem. Uh, that, that might be hard for some to stomach, but if you want to take it beyond each local problem to area problems, this is what Benergy and Duffalo do, but they do it in a scientific way. So. Um, <clears throat> The other thing they say is the role, role of aid in development is relatively small. I mean, historically, India has received almost no aid. It just almost means nothing, actually. So what, they're like, well, what's all this debate about aid? Forget it. It doesn't matter, in a sense, to what really is going to drive development. Um, so they're not talking about some deep problems when they talk about practical solutions sometimes. So what they're really big on and what I think is really fantastic about their book is they set things in the context of what are called randomized controlled trials. This is a standard scientific method used on, um, oh my goodness, all over science, all areas of science, okay? So let's consider, uh, how many people are familiar with randomized controlled trials? Anybody? Yes, one, two. Okay, so this is, uh, consider the following as an option, just as an example. So suppose you're trying to consider options of the following. Should people buy some technology? Should there be a subsidy for the technology, sell it at half price? Or should you just hand it out free technology? And in, the, in their book, they use the bed net for protection against mosquitoes to reduce malaria, incidence of malaria as an example. They talk about considering these options. The bed net, of course, is a technology. And then you study the outcomes, and that's some performance aspect of the technology, your willingness to purchase the next version of the technology. So what you do is you randomly, this is important, assign people to different options. So you, you, you just randomly, you get this whole random group of people in the whole region, and you just flip coins and you say, oh, you gotta buy it, oh, you get it subsidy, oh, you get it as free, and you just give them all out like this, okay? Um, this removes biases then. It's a pretty fundamental, uh, a fu fundamental importance in terms of the way this is working in terms of the underlying statistics. 
Um, you see what happens, okay? So you come back a year later, that's you run n experiments, where n is the number of people. And then what you do is you take the, the measures of goodness, like let's say you, you, you go to someone and say, um, well, did you get malaria in the last year? And they say, no. Well, you score it. You go to someone and say, oh, I had malaria twice. I had an incidence twice or whatever. And you score it different ways. And then out of those n people, you compute statistics, okay? The mean and standard deviation of what came out, okay? Um, and you like that for some big n for many people. Next, you pick the best solution. So what you say is, is wait a minute, the, the mean here in terms of measures best, reducing incidence of malaria. And it turns out it was best if I sold it as a subsidized, rather than just giving it away, for instance. You say, why, why would that be? Well, I mean, subsidy means that it was valuable enough to that person that they would give some money towards it, so they invested in it. It's likely they're going to get use the thing every night, OK? And whereas if you give it away, they might think, well, this isn't important. Can't be important if it didn't cost me. Yes. After they've assigned the groups, are the people forced to participate, or can they opt out? Uh, well, technically, um, they could opt out. Okay, and then you would have to decide how you're going to deal with that in your sampling. It, with, it, if they won't even interview with you after they opt out, then you're going to have to throw that piece out. Okay, but if if everybody interviews, then you you um, would have you could they would enter the means, but it, since it was randomized, it would be okay, they just didn't use it, okay? So anyway, you come up with a, the best solution by your definition, it might involve both mean and variance, and that is scientific evidence of the goodness of a technology then, okay? You can then, when you deploy humanitarian technology across a broad range, you can say, you can quantify that this is either good or bad or how good it was in terms of impact on real people, okay? Um, and uh, it's, it's really quite an important idea. We're going to come back to it later in class. Um, so the approach, of course, is only as good as the, the experiment design and whether you have a big enough end. Of course, what happens if you have a small end? You have three people with three options. I mean, it's not going to work, right? It's not going to allow you to generalize your conclusions. But if you have a thousand people, well, whew, that looks really good, okay? And you start worrying about things like um, statistical significance, if you're into statistics, okay? Things like that. Um, so you have to design your experiment carefully by picking your options and outcomes, okay? Because it's going to be very likely that it's costly to rerun experiments, okay? So this, this is what they claim will remove the guesswork of uh, development and bring rigor to the process. Um, Esther Dufflo has a really nice TED talk on this subject, okay? Um, th that I'd recommend um, just go to the TED site and, and Google her and you, you can take a look at it. Um, next, in this whole debate about whether there are poverty traps or not, you've got Sachs saying there are poverty traps and you got um, Easterly saying no. And so the, what they say is, yeah, there's specific cases on the ground meeting people would have poverty traps. And in particular, they explain very clearly uh, for individuals, they'll, they'll give the person's name and they'll, they'll explain why they're in a poverty trap, all the conditions around them. So that's what's nice about the book is, is it describes real situations on the ground. Um, but they say how complex it is and that there are different cases. So it's not just, they, they call them not just poverty traps, they call them health traps. Um, there's, there's poverty trap, health trap, education trap, just about any kind of trap you can think of. And it all makes sense. We had discussed the beginning of the social justice uh, part, uh, technological capacity trap, right? That's a type of a trap. Um, so next, um, also, I really like this. They emphasize the problems of ideology, ignorance, and inertia, the three I's. They say those are big problems in development. So ideology is something like this. You walk into the country, and you, you are, uh, oh, boy. You know, it's, it, this is tough, because whatever I pick here as an example is going to insult somebody in the room. Let's say you're a liberal. 
Okay? And you think the best thing to do is to give things away. Okay? So you start giving things away. Well, that's not necessarily the best solution. It may be better to sell something. Because then people will value it and use it. They really want it. Okay? Um, other people with other persuasions would come in and say, I'm selling this to you, and if you don't have the money, forget it. Full cost. I'm making a profit off of you. That may not work either. So what they, their view is, is don't have some, or you might have a religious ideology. You might say, I'll help you, and this happens in Columbus, Ohio, I'll help you if you sit and listen to the preacher for an hour. Okay? Um, these things are going on all over the world. So they say, forget about this ideology, go in there with an open mind, flexible attitude, figure out what works and make it work, okay? Next, ignorance, and what they're talking about here is ignorance of the real conditions on the ground. And that's, that's uh, you know, Saxon and Easterly are also both saying that. They're saying, you know, you really need to understand conditions on the ground. And sorry, but reading their book is going to help set the context, but it's not good enough. The only way to learn about conditions on the ground is to be on the ground. Okay, you gotta, you gotta be there, talk to people, understand people. Uh, it's difficult, um, you gotta understand the mess. Remember the quote I had, uh, if you wanna help um, fix the mess, you gotta be a part of the mess. The reason you have to be a part of the mess is because you can't fix the mess under, unless you understand the mess. It's sort of like an engineering problem. If you don't understand the problem, you can't solve the problem. It's, it's a rather obvious statement, okay? Next, inertia. Uh, inertia, they bring up, and, and, and the issue here is like, oh, we can't do that because they, you know, it, you know, the local government can't get things done. They don't respond fast. You know, the aid agency is slow at getting things done, and so it's sort of they, they, they say all the slowing down that goes on makes it hard to move things forward in a fast way. I mean, they, you can sense a real. Um, they have a sense of urgency. Look, we need to fix these problems now because there's a lot of people suffering. And they, you sense when you read their book that they're, they're frustrated. So hunger. So they analyze in their chapters, and I'm going to cover each chapter in a slide or two. They first talk about hunger. They want to know if hunger on the ground is a problem. They worked in 18 countries um, with people only living less than 99 cents a day. Um, and interestingly, when the poor... Um, when they get a little extra money, they don't spend it on food, even if they're hungry. So that's pretty interesting. Um, if they get extra money, um, the proportion that they spend on food does not increase. Okay, so it's the proportion that doesn't increase. Um, so what they do is you would think, well, why not concentrate your resources on high-calorie, micronutrient-rich food? That means food with good vitamins in it, right? Um, which well, they may not understand that piece of it, but they don't do that. Okay, they don't concentrate their resources on high calorie food. Okay, if they get extra funds, they go for better tasting food and more expensive calories. For example, they may buy rice or wheat. You know what rice tastes like? Everybody does. You know what wheat tastes like? Pick up a piece of wheat bread. That's what wheat tastes like—the raw grain. But how many people have tried millet? Two. Everybody can try milk. So this is my treat. So this this tastes like crap. Um, so give it a try. <laughs> no, it doesn't taste that bad. I'm just kidding. You're not gonna try it? Oh come on. Take a little pinch and you know, uh, it's it's uh, it, I got it at Whole Foods. I didn't you know, and uh, I think it's it's interesting actually. I think you're gonna see what I, I'm saying about this taste issue. I but I want to have a but I want to get your opinion on this, okay? Not chocolate, Valerie. I know. <laughs> India. The poor and the rich are actually spending less and less on food and more on expensive food. The poor are not eating more when they can, they're eating less. So their claim is that there's enough food. Only 2% of the world say they do not have enough food. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Okay, now we got to be careful with this, though. They're going to back down a little bit from that statement, in a sense. So what they're saying is that fewer people are doing physical labor, and they're less eating. But they think that's a small effect. Um, and they say this new tape, they, they use this trap idea all over the place. So they say, is there a nutrition-based trap? 
And they say that's not that common. So they say that hunger is actually not a big part of the story of the persistence of poverty. I was pretty surprised to read this. Um, you know, we always think of providing food, right? Um, and uh, they're saying, no, not really. That's not, you know, we're talking about, you know, got to keep in mind, the extreme poor, okay? Um, so are the poor eating well? They say, actually, no. There's widespread malnourishment in underdeveloped countries. So there's about one in five children under the age of three has severe malnourishment. I don't know, that's depressing, okay? I mean, isn't it? That's, that's absolutely depressing. Um, one in, what is it, one in five children in the United States is under the poverty, living under the poverty line. I don't know if you ever met one of these children. Uh, uh, my wife and I used to work with a boy in Big Brother, Big Sister, and you know, I tell you, you go over there and, uh, and you pop that fridge open and it's empty. It's pretty amazing, okay? Uh, this is a huge problem, actually, worldwide. Children, it stunts your growth, okay? Um, they have low weight. Uh, and in fact, it causes deficits in cognitive functioning. In fact, it'll affect your IQ, okay? Um, and of course, smarter people generally learn, earn more money. So this just hurts them in many ways. It's, um, so, on the one hand, they say food isn't a big problem in a sense, but in another sense, it is in terms of malnourishment. It's getting the right food. Um, so there's some is evidence that better nourishment um, results in higher productivity, but it doesn't matter how much you eat. Some employers may not pay more. They're giving you a piece rate, right? A piece rate in a sweatshop means you know you you, you manufacture five of these, you get you know, a certain amount of money, and you get double the amount of money if you manufacture ten of them. That's piece rate. Um, a self-employed worker, however, may earn more if they're better nourished, have more um, energy, and so forth. But their claim is, is that most are not held back by food, but problems of malnourishment. Okay, so that people are eating enough, but not eating good food. Um, so we, we certainly need improvement um, for uh, uh, children and pregnant mothers. Is what they call for. Um, so, is food important to the poor or not? Well, I mean, why do they say pregnant mothers? So, so if, you, if you're, if you're um, malnourished is, is right from birth, um, you end up with stunted growth and cognitive deficits and all those problems, okay? But the problem is, is that if you are in the womb and the mother is malnourished, guess what? You get these problems too. And uh, so, so um, when uh, it takes then a, more than a generation to get rid of this problem, okay? Because if, if it's the mom, then the, it, it is malnourished, the kids are going to have problems. But if you solve the problem for the mom and the kids, then you're solving the problem sort of right away. Okay, so it, it's a it's a complicated issue because of that intergenerational. Um, aspect of it. Okay, people also in this range, amazingly enough, spend significant money on weddings, dowries, and christenings. Um, likely to save face, they say. Okay, um, and entertainment. So the boredom problem they raise, which is fascinating. I mean, I can really imagine this if you, you know, you don't have a good job, you have periodic employment because you can't get anything better. Um, you're hanging around the hut or whatever you're living in. I mean, what do you do all day? I mean, it would just, they bring this up and say, it's just boring. You know, so they want some entertainment. Um, so one of the other, they think, so they're thinking very carefully about all these issues. Um, and of course, cultural issues have a big play in this weddings issue and so forth. Um, what they say too is that people learn not to have hope. And that could be absolutely depressing um, to, you know, when people are sort of like, well, this is always how it's been. I've talked to somebody like this. It's, it's really depressing. It's like, well, nothing will fix this. You know, you have an idea. It doesn't matter. It's because they've seen so many things fail in the past. It's like, whew, that's hard. That's hard. Um, but like every human being, they've got a basic need for a pleasant life. I mean, you want to have... You want to be happy and have a pleasant life, and you're, you're living under these bad conditions. Next, health. 
So health traps exist. The way this works is you have poor health, you can't get good work and get good income or get a good education. It, it impacts then the baby's health because mom is malnourished and in poor health. And then baby ends up in poor health and you're, guess what? You're back around this loop and you're stuck. You're going around that loop, you're stuck for generations. Um, so they feel that eliminating malaria is a good investment. There's a lot of worldwide effort in elimin eliminating malaria. And there's also already been some really good progress. And they also say clean water and sanitation are rarely very important. Um, they say that even subsidized bed nets, though, don't, aren't in high demand. Um, so the question is, do the poor care about health? And the answer is yes. Um, one quarter report being worried, tense, or anxious in the last month due to their health uh, um, or health of a relative. Um, they spend a lot on health care, but um, on expensive cures rather than inexpensive prevention. Okay, and it's often poorly um, administered. Does that sound familiar? I mean, how, how much in the United States is, is poured into fixing a problem that could have been avoided? This is a huge issue. That's a huge issue all over the world. If we could just try to be preventive, okay? Um, the big problem with trained, um, poorly trained health providers, they un underdiagnose and overmedicate, have high um, absenteeism, um, and ch the poor often do little things to fix their health because they can't afford the big one. You know, this is a diff this poorly trained issue uh, is is a difficult one. It, if someone, you know, you hear, let's say you go to Honduras and you say this this woman's a nurse, so ask yourself the question: What training she had? Do you think she had four-year college degree? <clears throat> Um, far less, typically, far, far less. Um, if she even finished high school, she would have some, some few week training program, so, for instance, okay? So when someone's called a nurse or a doctor, you can't assume an equivalency, just like you wouldn't assume that with engineering. There's other countries you can go to and their engineering programs and degrees mean every bit as much as here or more, but, in general, no. Okay. Um, so people need education about value prevention, like immunization, and to fight against superstitions. So should immunizations be forced by law? A libertarian would say absolutely not. Remember the debate over just a couple weeks ago, um, and, and he said, "Should we have you know law be in immunizations?" The politician stepped up and said, "A few of them said no." Do you remember who? And people were like, are you kidding? Public health officials were like, you guys are a bunch of idiots. You can't say that. So we do this in this country. It's law. You have to get an immunization, set of immunizations, or you can't go to school as a kid. Right? And we all accept it. Okay? So should that be happening in these countries? Should they have laws? Should they enforce them? And so forth. Okay? Um, so... In fact, we have those laws because we've voted, essentially, to make it happen. Because it's good for everybody. All right, this one, I'm not going to cover all of it. I just want to, I really like this section of the book. It's one, it's one of the best sections. So what they do is they say, think about it for a minute, your life compared to someone who's living on a dollar a day. All right, and so they say, okay, you live in a house and you've got clean, piped-in water. Turn on the faucet. Drink right out of that tap, right? No problem anywhere in the United States. I've never heard of any problem anywhere where you wouldn't be able to do that. You think you can do that in Honduras or Guatemala? <clears throat> no way, okay? Um, you have sewage, okay? Your toilet flushes and just, it goes out and mysteriously it goes somewhere. Where in their case does it go? A uh, house I visited last summer in Guatemala, where it went is they don't have toilets. They went out in the field, okay? So you don't worry about where your next meal is coming from. Well, I'm worried about where dinner's gonna be. Now, you, you really, you basically don't worry about it, okay? Um, if you have a health problem, there's plenty of well-trained doctors around. You can get in easily. Student health center, your family doctor, whatever you can get. And these are really trained experts, okay? 
We have the required immunization. So you send your kids to school, you're not worried that they're gonna get whatever from another kid, right? They're gonna get the flu and different, I mean, they're gonna get that kind of stuff, but they're not gonna get the, the, the tough stuff, okay? Um, and then most people, or oh, I gotta be careful. Most people have health insurance. I know that's controversial issue in the United States. I don't know what percentage it is right now of insured versus uninsured, but um, the percentage of un uninsured in the United States is going down now because of Obamacare. Okay, whether you like it or not, that's happening. That's, that's just a statistic that's come out. So what their point is, is like, we don't even have to think about anything. We just, it's just all just sort of right there. It's coming to you and everything's cool and happy and we're comfortable. Whereas someone living on 99 cents a day has to worry about all this stuff at once. And there are very risky situations here, you know, because of this, the first two are gonna cause you major health problems, impact whether your kids can go to school and you can go to work. You may not be able to get your problems fixed because people won't know how to do it, can't get access to the right care. Kids and you may get sick because of other people around you and very serious illnesses, and you don't have health insurance, period, okay? So, so it really is a stark contrast um, between like how we live our lives and how they live their lives. And you have to respect those differences. So it's interesting. He, it, so they say people do not in the developed world don't need to draw on their limited endowment of self-control and decisiveness. While the poor are constantly required to do so. That's an interesting statement they make. I mean, so they're saying, you know, we have to admit we're not that smart, you know. <laughs> It's, it's, what they're essentially saying is, is a lot of people put this system together that are smart so that we don't have to be so smart. It, the clean water's just coming in. I don't have to worry about filtering my water. I don't have to worry about where the flush of my toilet goes. All that's been taken care of by civil engineers, right? But really, it has been taken care of. And, and so you just sort of, what do you do? We can focus on other stuff like class, like work like raising your kids, like whatever. So it's sort of like we're removed, insulated from this basic level. It's a sort of a basic support system that we have. It's hard to remember that we have it, okay? You sort of, since it's like all around us all the time. Um, so this is easy for the poor to, per, to get preventive care and regulate the quality of treatment, um, to get preventive services for free. Um, some people say it's paternalism forcing the poor to do these things, but there's all kinds of paternalism going on in our lives. We don't even talk about it that way. You guys are forced to use a sanitation system, essentially. I mean, you can't, you can't be going to the bathroom out in the street, okay? You can get your butt thrown in jail. You can't, you, and you have to get the immunizations, et cetera, et cetera. That's paternalism, okay? So they're questioning how the whole system should be. Next, education. Um, primary schools are abundant. Absentee rate, rates vary between 14 and 50%. Wow. So why aren't kids going to school? We're going to talk about that next week. Okay. Um, so kids sometimes aren't needed at home, but they have, when they have health problems, sometimes then they're not forced to go. And I bring up this, I love this term, maybe um, Abhishek could comment, Walla. So, so this came from uh, Banerjee. Um, the supply wall is versus the demand wall is with respect to education. And basically the way to think about it is a supply wall is somebody that says, so getting the facilities and the teachers is all that's important. A demand wall that says we've got to get the people to say they want education and then we'll get the facilities. Okay, so the supply wall is like the movie, um, if you build it, they will come, okay? Um, and this is like, they will, if they come, you will build it, okay? And you know, Saks is sort of on this side, Easterly is sort of on this side. And basically what Banerjee Duffalo says, you're both wrong, both are needed, okay? Or you could say, he said that they say, they're both right, but they're both needed, there's no conflict. You need to have people want it, and it's got to be available both at the same time. We'll talk more about education next week. They say that private schools are generally better, um, and that's what I've seen too. Um, uh, parent expectations, though, of education, like that you're going to get a job, 
they feel are unrealistic. Just getting an education doesn't get you a job. Um, so parents often focus their resources, financial resources. These schools, um, by the way, often cost. Um, they're got, they've got a tuition type thing going on sometimes. They almost always will have, you have to purchase a uniform um, and, uh, it, in, and then also some supplies and so forth. Um, and so it does take real resources to send a child. And they'll often focus those resources on a promising child. Remember Chino. Chino didn't win. I mean, he, they needed him in the fields and he couldn't go to school. Okay. Um, teachers often have low expectations or teach over the heads of children. Um, and they say that the curriculum and the teaching is basically designed for rich, not regular children. The curriculum, curricula have, have often come from the colonial power um, and passed down. Uh, so it focuses on the upper crust and doesn't speak to the people. Um, so that becomes quite a problem. So the children of rich go to schools where more is taught, taught better, and the students are treated with compassion and help to re re reach their potential. Sound familiar, right? I think everybody in this room was probably educated that way. I mean, people, the teachers cared that you learn. And they, they taught you good material. And of course, there's counterexamples. Some teachers aren't so good, but generally speaking, okay? Um, if you don't have that, you don't, you're not taught much. They, they don't teach good. They don't, they, they're brutal with you. Um, they don't treat you with compassion. If you can't learn, it's a big problem. Again, we're gonna come back to this next week, this education issue. Um, they hold out hope though. Um, they feel that making sure that every child learns the basics is really quite easy. They're pretty optimistic. Um, they think you should focus on basic skills and have every child um, learn those and that, that requires very little teacher training, which is good because you gotta remember, it's not like air, okay? So, so what do you think um, the education level of a teacher of grade school is in the developing world? Did they finish grade school? Probably. Okay, so, so it, it depends. Every country's different. I can't comment in general what it is, but you know, what the developing countries I've been to, it's not like the standards aren't like here, okay? Um, Schools should be or reorganized for self-paced learning, helping children who fall behind. So this self-paced learning thing is, is uh, this was popular in, even when I was a child. Um, and uh, so what they're saying is let the kids that really can learn and excel do it, self-pace them. But the ones that are falling behind, help them, okay? A lot of, you know, a lot of educational programs in this country are like that. Um, Oh, family issues. So there's many uh, countries in the developing world that have higher fertility rates. Um, so the question is, does that make them poorer or is it the opposite? Is it that because they're poorer that they have high fertility? Okay, which isn't, most people think it's the first one. Okay, in other words, if people make a lot of babies and that makes them poorer. Okay, so it's, it's actually much more complicated than that. So family size, um, so it isn't the case that it creates poverty for a family because they invest less in nutrition, food, less in education, and health care for each child. Is that what's going on is the question. So the evidence is that in some countries, children in large families do actually have less education in some countries. But there's no evidence for the following. Children in small families do get more education, even in the very poor populations they're working with. And the evidence shows that family size has no adverse impacts on a child's education. There's no, there's no evidence that shows that. Okay, next. Pregnancy, because of health problems, marriage, and marriage, um, especially I'm thinking here in some countries where girls are marrying at just over 12 years old, okay, um, for instance, um, lead women to get less education. Uh, and then they go into the contraception argument and talk about the supply versus demand issue. Um, in some countries, there may not be the demand uh, and so forth, okay. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious that women pay most of the cost of having a baby, 
Um, but it, the Bitter Energy Duffalo discussed this issue quite a bit. Um, what do you mean by paying cost? Well, it means many things. It means per the woman's health and the adverse impact on her health, for instance, with a difficult pregnancy. Um, it's a strenuous. I'm sure, ladies, you could jump in here anytime, but it is also a it's sort of their task, right? And then when the baby is born, most often it's their task, okay? By the cultural norms, etc. The, the woman is taking care of the child, raising the child primarily, okay? Now, I know men jump in and help too, but it depends. It, it depends on each individual relationship. I think we all know that. It, it, it's highly dependent on the situation, okay? So what's interesting though is they do. They talk about these studies, and they show that men want to have more babies in the family than ch than women. Well, duh. Men aren't paying the cost. That's their basic point. Right? And they say they explain, even go into this and say, explain that the mother-in-law is putting a lot of pressure on the situation and the community. Everybody's like, have babies, have babies, have babies, and and. The man is saying, we're having babies, we're having babies, we're having babies. And the woman's there, I don't want to have babies. May not speak up. I don't want to have, this is too much on me. This is, we don't need this. We can't take care of these kids, blah, blah, blah. And so why is it that the, the, the fertility rates are going down? Because women's rights are improving. If a woman gets more rights, she, she can put her fist down and say, no, that's it. You know? So, so women's rights is, on this issue are really incredibly important. Um, I know this might be controversial for some people, but, well, this is what the book says. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I have to say that when, this, when, I hear, when I hear statements like this, this is the U.S. too, okay? I mean, you know, I, I can tell you a number of friends or family where it's like, this, you, you can always hear, the, the, you know, do you want, hey, you guys have another baby? I asked my brother and, and sister-in-law, for instance, and, Year, a couple of year, number of years ago, and it's, and the, and the, the guy will say, well, yeah, we're thinking about it, and <laughs> his sister-in-law, his sister-in-law's in there going, no. <laughs> so, I mean, I've seen it in my own life here. It's, it's, this has happened. With me and my wife, we didn't have this issue. Do you want to adopt another baby? <laughs> you know, it's a little different. I can work with lawyers just as well as she can, so <laughs> <laughs> the load is just as heavy on me. Um, children, are they a good economic investment? Uh, this, is, this really starts getting at some issues too. They are an insurance policy, okay, to take care of the parents in their old age. That's a very important issue. If I have a pension at Ohio State, I don't have to worry about this. I don't need to crank out more babies, okay? Next. There are savings, okay? Want, there are a way to save. I make another baby, that baby is gonna grow up and work in the fields and give me income. So it, it's like a savings, it's like a savings account. It's gonna have a return. They're like lottery tickets, okay? So you don't know who's gonna succeed as a child, who's gonna make it. Past all the health problems, stunted growth, cognitive difficulties, blah, blah, blah. And so what you, you do is, is you, you gotta buy enough lottery tickets so you win. So that one of them will pay off so they can give me more money and they can give me my insurance policy and take care of me in my old age when I'm not able to work. Because I have no insurance, okay? Um, and then the, the harsh reality at the bottom is sons pay off and girls don't, they cost. Now, in India, I know this is true, I don't know all the details, but I know some of this is being rejected these days in India, but, you know, you've got the dowry problem, so there's a cost to the girl, and then you pay the dowry, and guess what? She's gone. She's essentially, she's part of the other family, and, and there's no income necessarily coming back. So it's, it's all cost and no benefit, and that's why via ultrasound, we have the current sex ratio in India and China and others, okay? It's, it's financial. So if you look at this financial stuff, it's, it seems harsh at first glance. You say, hold on a minute. Well, that's not how we decide whether to have babies or not, because of money, right? But come on, this is happening all the time in this country. When is it happening? 
If I say to somebody, and I tell somebody, my wife and I have four children. It's like, how can you afford that? You know how many people say that to you? It's money. People say that to me. I'm like, I just laugh. <laughs> what do you, you know, say to that? But so it is about money too. I mean, it's a harsh reality. Um, I mean, and then this issue, uh, all these issues make it, you know, it's it's a financial investment issue then too. So there are ways to save. But so when for, but when fertility drops, savings go up, and you don't see the need for smaller family um, increases in investment in children for health and education. There's a higher value on boys, so there's a lot of sex selective issues going on here, and how girls are treated. The, you want to talk about a controversial issue? Talk about that second bullet, okay? Because you're talking about you know we're talking about sex selective abortion, okay? And and. You know, for some people that's fine, and some people that's not fine at all. It's a very complicated issue. Um, this one's really, I hadn't thought of this before I read this book. So what you're going to do in the strategy is you're going to have kids until you get a boy. So you can have a sequence of girls, but you need that boy to cash in on. Okay? So what that implies is, statistically, if you think about it a minute, girls are living in larger families in the developing world. Wow. So they're, they're automatically, via this, this strategy of investment, having a side effect of diffi more difficult situation than boys. Okay? Um, actually, they bring up this issue that girls are not breastfed as uh, long, um, because, which is, many people understand now, the benefits of breastfeeding on, on many aspects of the health of a baby. Okay? Um, as long to avoid the contraceptive effect um, of breastfeeding, okay? Um, because they're try, try, try for a boy. So they're like, oh, you know, wean the girl, okay, quickly, so you can get pregnant and get the boy. And so, of course, it's pretty clear that's going to cause health problems. All these things combine. It's not necessarily any one issue. It's, it's taken all together. So, do parents look out for the best interests of their children, especially girls? Is the mother of the family treated fairly? They say that there's evidence that women's initiatives at earning are given less support than men's. Even, this is a cultural issue, even if that woman can go out and get that job and really improve the financial situation at home, it doesn't happen, right? Because she's a woman, okay? Man, it's supposed to go out and get that money, okay? How, even in the United States, this is an issue. Can you be a husband-wife pair, and, and can the woman make more than the man? I think you know what I'm talking about. This becomes an issue sometimes. For, for some couples, some men have no problem with that. Go make the money, baby. Well, that's great, <laughs> okay? But trust me, there are some men that have a big problem with that, right? Or the education level. Can women, do you think you can marry a, a, a man that has less education than you? High school education, you're going to get your PhD. Is that a problem? <laughs> okay. Um, so what he, they're saying is, is households really aren't as productive as they could be because of these issues. Next, risk. Risk is a key part of lives of the poor. Um, bad luck hurts the poor more. We talk, you should be thinking of the simulation at the end of chapter one now. Remember the risk and suffering and uh, trying to save money and all those difficulties? So risk causes worry, stress, and depression. Um, it's harder to focus, impair cognition, impairs decision-making ability, and you become less productive. Everybody knows that stress has pervasive impacts on health, okay? Um, so what the poor do to avert risk is they create their own employment via farms. But of course, there's a weather problem. Small businesses are day jobs of indeterminate length. And they try to make money in any way that they can. So if they have bad luck, do they work more? Um, sometimes the problems are uh, widespread in terms of wages going down. Really what they say is that often the poor are having a diversified portfolio approach. So they'll have many occupations, work many different small jobs. They might go out and wash windshields for a while, and then they come back and grow some garden, try to get some food, and they're doing a day job here and there. Um, 
and they have more children because they're, that's in their financial portfolio to help them. Um, and then they, they're typically conservative to avoid risk in, in trying new things, okay? Um, sometimes to, to avert risk, they'll become someone's shared tenant. And you know what that means, right? You, somebody, some big rich guy owns a bunch of land and they break it up in little pieces and let the poor take a little piece and then they have to give a certain amount of the money to the farmer, to the owner of the, the tenant, okay? Um, so the poor rely on social connections to elicit cooperation of other poor people in their community. Um, in fact, in strong relationships between each other, the poor have more relationships, it's been shown, than the rich do. In other words, they're well connected in strong relationships as much as possible to make themselves successful in their, and cooperate. Okay, that's why I emphasize cooperation in chapter two. What are the limits of cooperation? If you help someone, will they really help you later? Well, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, can this work with widespread health problems? In other words, if everybody's bad off with health, how can they help each other? Um, I say that insurance is essentially absent in the developing world. Is that an opportunity? Okay. Um, and they, they say that there's a, a difficulty in people understanding that even the concept of insurance and, and trust. You know, I pay you something, and if something bad happens, I get money. But if something bad doesn't happen, I don't get money back. I mean, it's, it seems like you're, you're getting cheated in a sense. Okay? So what they recommend is, is that you create up subsidized insurance. Next, loans. Well, they, they go into a lot of details here, but you all know, have heard about microfinance now. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they talk about this a bit in Energy and Duffalo, but what they try to do is study whether it's effective or not. And it's interesting, um, some of their comments, they pay a much higher interest on their loans than we do. I mean, the poor are paying 20 to 40% a year on a loan. Could you imagine? I mean, that's really tough. All right, and in particular, even some companies or micro finance institutions have charged too high a rates. The evidence of success of microfinance um, is, they say, weak. Um, they think that um, it, it's no miracle, but it's working. But it's had, they say it has no measurable impact on women's empowerment, although you'd like to think that it is. Remember the scene in Living on One Dollar where the women were all at the microfinance, they're getting the loans, they're doing the savings, managing the funds, and you think, wow, that's cool. But their claim is, is it's not having an impact on, um, it's not in, in, uh, on um, education or, or health or the likelihood that a, a child would be enrolled in a private school. So they're doing, they're basing their statements not just like on, like sit around and just write it. They're, they're doing scientific studies of it and outcome studies and, and saying, you know, this isn't mattering much. They say in the end that they make this conclusion basically, it's no miracle like a lot of people think it is, but it seems to be working. I mean, they're not like kill these programs. It seems to be having some impact. Um, how the poor save? Slowly build a house. You, when you travel to the developing world, this is one of the things you see. You see this half built house and you're like, well, what they're doing is they go buy a few more bricks and they put a few more bricks on the house and then they come back three months later when they have more money and they put another, and they keep building the house. Right. Um, so you might say, well, they should be pull, they should be um, saving to avoid risk. Um, for example, if you have, for a bad farming year or health problems, but you can't save what you don't have. And you remember the simulations from the end of chapter one. Okay. But managing in Duffalo, this this writing here impacted the way I formulated those simulations. I mean, this the, they say that even saving a little makes sense. Well, remember, that was the case. Even saving a nickel a day made a big difference for the poor guy that was simulated, right? In chapter one, was they were able to accumulate wealth and, and get $25 and hold it in their pocket. Um, they have a, a fair amount of ingenuity in uh, managing finances. He talked about savings clubs and depositing money with money lenders, hiding money for emergencies, using cell phones to, to facilitate deposits. Um, so they use, there's this tricky thing. I'll, I'll let you look at the book on this. I'm not going to get into it. They actually use loans in order to save. Now that is really weird. Okay. Um, 
Are the poor, some people have suggested the poor are born entrepreneurs. And Benerjee and Duffalo say, uh, no. They may have plenty of ideas and initiatives, but their businesses are really tiny. They have almost no return. That's very competitive. Um, if you've been to the developing world, you'll see, like in the streets or in the markets, it's incredibly competitive between the rest of them. And uh, basically what they say is, is they're not entrepreneurs. This is their way to buy a job. Their economy has failed. They're just trying to make money. Jobs. A lot of poor want a government job. Um, they say that employment in a sweatshop can provide a stable employment. That can be very important because the income stream becomes constant. It may not be great, but it's something. Okay? And the conditions at the sweatshop might be horrible, but it's better than what they have. Um, they actually say there's evidence of positive influence of employment in sweatshops on women workers in that their children are less stunted in growth. A scientific study. That's amazing. So these sweatshops are having a real impact. So don't be going out and protesting against sweatshops unless you know what you're talking about. I mean, sometimes a sweatshop, like Sachs says, sometimes a sweatshop can be really, really good. Okay. Of course, nobody wants to mistreat anybody. We ought to be making sweatshops the right way, especially because engineers help make sweatshops. Think manufacturing lines. Okay. But you got to be careful. Okay. Um, these sweatshops can provide hope. Better ability to plan for the future because of stable employment, invest in education. Um, then they can easily commit on future spending and it, may, it becomes less expensive to borrow, easier for schools to take their kids. They can get expensive treatments from hospitals. So good jobs are really important. So the question is, do good jobs imply fewer jobs? This is a debate that goes on in this country all the time. Think about it. If, if you improve the quality of jobs in the sweatshop, pay each people, person more money, then does that mean that we can employ fewer people? Okay. Um, they say, well, in the United States, you, you know, there's a similar question about minimum wage, for instance. Okay. Um, it may be worth it to have fewer good jobs because it's a positive impact on children. So they're, they're willing to say, cut out a few people, Take care of these people the best because you're going to help their kids too, right? And then they bring up this issue, should microfinance uh, expand? Don't give, the, remember the loan sizes and living on $1? They were like, I don't know, $200 here, whatever. I mean, they were small. They're saying, wait a minute, why don't we give bigger loans? These people really can start a business, a serious <laughs> business. Um, okay, five lessons. Number one, sorry, I'm going to need a few minutes here. Um, the poor need better information. Okay. The poor are burdened with responsibility for too many aspects of their life. They got to worry about their sewage, their water, all this different stuff. Markets are missing or unfavorable to the poor. In other words, you can't get them on the economic ladder. Poverty history don't do a poor country to stay poor. There are many problems due to the three eyes: the ideology, ignorance, and inertia. And there's expectations about what the poor are able or unable to do to end up be, being self-fulfilling prophecies. Now, for me, um, listen, there's many technologies for the five recommendations above, and the eyes are important for the engineer, especially that ignorance issue. If you don't understand what's going on on the ground, you know, you can't be a good humanitarian engineer, period. We're going to be talking about that in chapter four in a lot of ways. RCTs will return to. That's really valuable in the context of humanitarian engineering. And that's all 